Today I'm going to break down the two most common types of knee pain, what they are and what you can do about it to get some pretty quick results improving how you feel and how that knee moves. Now I like to refer to the knee affectionately as a pretty dumb joint because it doesn't have a whole lot to do with its own movement and it's pretty dependent on what happens above and below it. The resulting movement at the knee, whether it's good or bad, is simply just a consequence of what's happening at the hip and the femur and the tibia and the foot. The first very important thing to understand about the knee is that the way that it moves is often misinterpreted as simply just a hinge joint, meaning that it just bends and extends. It flexes and extends. And it's just this hinge joint that occurs in a forward back movement. This is not true because the knee, just like every other joint in the body, has rotation in it. And we need rotation in order to make up this sagittal plane action, which is referred to as knee extension and flexion. So when the knee extends, this is requiring something called the screw home mechanism of the knee. So as this knee extends, Extends, this patella needs to lock into place and it needs to move a little bit laterally. So you see, as I lock out, this knee is going to screw home into place. So what needs to happen is that this femur right here, the furthest part of the femur needs to internally rotate in that way as the tibia externally rotates and moves out this way. That's going to secure the patella in the position that we want. Therefore, the inverse would be true for knee flexion. As this knee unlocks and bends, this femur is going to externally rotate as this tibia internally rotates. So you're going to see the opposite occur the more the knee bends. Now there's two main types of knee pain, inner and outer knee pain. Pain on the inside, more medial knee pain. Pain on the outside, more lateral knee pain. We're going to start with inner knee pain first because that's something that is more associated frequently with the knee collapsing inwards, which is what a lot of people are trying to prevent at the knee. This is a very common thing you see. You don't wanna see knee valgus as people refer to it. Knee valgus and the knee collapsing inwards, yes, does place more pressure on the inside part of the knee, but what is it? It's not just the whole leg internally rotating. What you're actually seeing there is this femur internally rotating while this tibia is going to externally rotate. And that causes that pressure to go in and the knee to collapse in. And that can place more pressure on the inside of the knee over time. This is a lack of tibial internal rotation and a lack of femoral external rotation. What you often see at the foot when this knee goes into valgus like this is the foot pronating and collapsing in. And so people will say, oh, that's a pronated foot. That's a collapsed in foot. Well, that's not actually real pronation. What you're seeing here is the whole foot collapse in because of this tibial external rotation and knee valgus action forcing that foot in. Genuine foot pronation would have the knee go relatively over the foot as the arch subtly goes down. And you would see other specific things that the foot happen, which I talk about in other videos on the foot and ankle. But for the most part, it's important to understand that this is not genuine pronation. This is just compensatory pronation because of what's happening up top. What you're going to see usually at the pelvis with knee pain that's more on the inner medial side is an anterior orientation of the pelvis because what that does is that pushes the femur into internal rotation. So these people usually have a pelvis that's chronically in a forward position, which is driving the femur into an internally rotated position. So the tibia is relatively going to externally rotate. Now the femur is likely in the position that it's in because it's not able to access external rotation because the pelvis can't access a more neutral position because if it could, then it'd be able to access this and the femur would be able to slide more forward within the hip socket. But that's blocked if you're forward and you can't get that femur to translate forward. Now let's talk about lateral knee pain because there are similarities. And what you're seeing with lateral knee pain is usually a femur that's in more of an externally rotated position. And what you're seeing at the tibia right here is that the femur is so externally rotated that the tibia is going to start to follow it out into external rotation. And that's going to pull the patella off to the side. And that's going to put a lot of stress right here on the outer portion of the knee. 
So what you can see from this angle is external rotation here, twisting out, and also twisting out here. That's putting that pressure right on that outer plateau. So what you're seeing in both of these cases is external rotation of the tibia. Now, that's quite interesting, right? And what you're going to see at the foot with lateral knee pain is also a foot that can't pronate very genuinely. Because in order to pronate, you need this tibia bone to be able to internally rotate, which is going to allow for the bones and the ankle to move to allow for dorsiflexion and pronation. So you're going to see oftentimes a foot that can't move into dorsiflexion and pronation very well in either of these cases, but especially this lateral knee pain. Now, if you want to learn more about how foot pronation works and what you can do to improve it, I have a separate video on that that you can see and I will link down below. At the pelvis, what you're usually seeing with lateral knee pain is the backside of the pelvis and muscles on the backside are squeezing the backside of the pelvis together. So it's pulling these bones together and it's blocking off space right here. Muscles that externally rotate the femur usually attach on the back side of the pelvis right here. Now that's going to squeeze and pull that femoral head forward and that can lead to a lot of external rotation at the femur. So regardless, usually what you're going to see in both of these cases, inner and outer knee pain, is a lack of knee flexion. Now if I put you in a prone position on your belly with more of a neutral pelvis position, so I had something underneath your low ribs to keep you a little bit more neutral, and I had you pull your heel towards your butt, that would be testing for more and more internal rotation of the tibia the closer you got to your butt. Ideally, you'd be able to get your heel pretty close to your butt, but in either of these cases, that's not really going to be a reality for most people. So we generally want to start working on the ability to internally rotate the tibia. Here's my favorite exercise to get people to internally rotate the tibia that leads to pretty great results with people feeling better in their knee almost immediately. What we're gonna to do to set up for this, for this first option, is get a bench or some object we can keep our whole foot flat, and we have a 90 degree bend at both our knees and our hips right here. I wouldn't go higher than that, because this is about the right amount of height here where we can really get a good grip of our shin and go through this effectively, through the full range of motion. We also have a band around the upper part of the tibia bone. So that is the bottom of the knee or the top of the bottom of the knee. So if we have our kneecap right here, we have this bone right here under it. We have the band just around the top portion of it right here. So that way we can get a good grip on it. And the band should be tight enough to where you can get some good tension and friction, but not so tight to where it's cutting off any blood supply. And then what we're gonna do is get the whole foot flat on that bench right there. And we have a staggered stance. And the important thing here throughout the duration of this entire exercise is we keep our hips square, or as square as we possibly can. So this looks good right here. Foot's flat in the back. And now we're gonna grab hold of that band and wrap our fingers around our tibia, get a good grip here. Now we're gonna start always the whole foot's flat, but we're gonna start in this negative shin angle position. So this angle right here should be like so, and we have our weight mostly on our outside heel. Now, as we slowly come forward, pushing our knee over our second toe, we're gonna to twist pretty aggressively, about a six or seven out of 10, and progressively twist more and more the more this knee goes over the second toe. What we're going to feel is our weight transition from this point right here, that negative shin angle, outside of the heel, as we go forward, we're going to transition our weight more onto the inner heel and first metatarsal head right here. So that's basically on my foot right here and right here. We're not rolling onto the inside edge and losing the outside edge, we're just focused on that transition right there from the outside to the inside. And then we're just going to untwist as we come out. So untwist, go on the outside heel, twist forward progressively as you go more and more into dorsiflexion and pronation of your foot. Okay, so from a side view, we've got this negative tibia angle to start. He's gonna grab the band, start on the outside heel, then as he comes forward, he's gonna twist, and he's gonna go transition more into the inside edge of his foot. 
The most common mistake on this exercise is people are going to twist their hip outside of their knee and the knee is gonna dive inside the foot. So for optimal restoration of movement of the tibia and the femur and the foot, we need to make sure that everything stays in line. So we should have a perfectly straight line here as much as we can. So if Trevor, you grab and then you try to keep everything in line as you come forward, beautiful, just like that. If your hip ever starts to dip outside, then you're probably moving too much through your hip. And you're probably also going to put too much stress on the inside of your knee right there. As you progress through this, you can do a couple more sets but roll the band down a little bit further on your tibia right there. So maybe a couple inches further down, you can do the same exact thing. For some people, this is very helpful. And then you could progressively work it down to the point where you are even lower than that, maybe right about here. But different people have different bone structures, so it will depend on what works best for you. Ideally, at least do up here and maybe a little further down. If you want, you can go even lower. If that position on the bench isn't comfortable for you, what you could do is get in this half kneeling position with your back knee directly underneath your back hip. And you also have right here, this foot out in front a little bit more than a 90 degree angle so that way you can start in again, that negative tibia angle, grab it, and then just do the same exact thing. Again, making sure that everything stays in line, the knees going over the second toe, outside heel to inside edge. Now we gotta also address the position of the pelvis because if we're not addressing the pelvis, then we're pushing our femur and keeping our femur in the position which is contributing to this knee pain. So let's talk about inner knee pain first. We usually have that forward position of the pelvis. So what we want to do is recruit muscles like the hamstrings and glutes on the backside of the pelvis to help get this pelvis more in a neutral position, more of a relative posterior pelvic tilt. Now we can do this easily with an exercise like this. If you like this comprehensive approach to issues like knee pain that accounts for all potential variables, but also gives you exercises that are simple and practical, check out my beginner body restoration program, which addresses a lot of common issues with the body. But if you want a more specific approach, you can check out my lower limb foundations program, which is more specifically geared towards things like the knee, the shin, the ankle, and the foot. This is the hook line hamstring bridge with a ball hold. The setup for this, we're in this A-frame position with our feet flat on the ground, the whole foot flat on both sides. And we have a ball that allows our knees to stay in line with our toes and our hips. It's not too wide, shoving our knees out, not too narrow, getting our knees to cave in. It should be keeping it in line with both the hips and the knees. And then what we're gonna do is just place our hands on our low ribs and maintaining the whole foot flat, we're gonna focus on keeping the weight in the heels. So we don't want the toes to come up as a result of that, keep the whole foot flat. But think about trying to drag your heels towards your butt. They won't move, but the intention will get your pelvis to slightly lift off of the floor. So your low back stays flat, but your tailbone is slightly off of the floor and you should feel your hamstrings on both sides engage. And you're gonna hold that position as you breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth, get all the air out until you feel a little bit of side ab engagement, and then pause, close your mouth, tongue on the roof of your mouth, inhale through the nose, and you're gonna feel your rib cage expand, keeping a little bit of that side ab tension when you inhale. If you're having a hard time finding your hamstrings, what you can do is place a couple of dumbbells in between your heels and your hips, and that'll allow you to drag back into some external object so you can find those hamstrings a little bit better. Now for lateral knee pain, outer knee pain, remember the backside of the pelvis is usually compressed and dragging that femur out into external rotation. So what we wanna do is open up the backside of the pelvis and actually drive more internal rotation because the more this stretches out the backside of the pelvis, the more this femur can go into internal rotation and therefore we can help undo some of that external rotation bias of the femur. And hinge positions are really good for that. So here is one way that you can do that pretty easily. What we're gonna need here is a ball or something slightly compressible like a pillow folded in half. But whatever we're using, it needs to, when it's in between our thighs right here, allow us to keep our knees in line with our toes and also in line with our hips, with our feet perfectly straight ahead. If it's too big and pushing our knees out or too small collapsing our knees in, we don't want that. So right about here is what we want. And then we wanna start with our hands at shoulder height and we want to walk slightly back to where we can feel our whole foot flat. 
and we're on a slight incline right here. But depending on how long or short your arms are, you may need to play around with how far away you are from the wall. And now you're going to bend your knees about 20%. And what I want you to focus on are the foot cues here. So you want to feel on both sides equally, the inner heel right here and the first metatarsal head. So the ball of your foot underneath the big toe. That doesn't mean you're losing your outside foot and rolling inside. It just means that that's where the majority of the weight in your foot is, specifically within that heel there. So I'm going to start in this position. I need to keep a neutral spine the entire time. So notice how I'm hinging back. It's almost like I'm doing a deadlift as I very slowly walk my hands down that wall, keeping my arms pretty straight. You're going to get to a position where you're in the end range of your active hip flexion, meaning that if I were to go any lower, my back would start to round and it would move independently of my pelvis. So I need to make sure that everything is moving together and I'm stopping at that point. And my center of mass is going back onto my heels. So right about here for me is where I'm done, keeping those knees slightly bent. I should feel a slight stretch in my upper hamstrings, maybe a little bit in my glutes. I'm gonna maintain this position and very slowly squeeze the ball, just about a three to four out of 10. Breathing in through my nose, out through my mouth, maintaining that spine position for about five to eight breaths. Now the last thing we have to consider is the foot itself. Again, if we're not considering everything from the pelvis down to the foot, then we're not fully getting a comprehensive approach to knee issues. So we gotta make sure that this foot can genuinely pronate. The good news is with those exercises with the hip, they did have foot contacts present that help start to get the ball rolling with that but a lot of times that's not enough. So they need to learn how to actually work on their pronation. I have a video that I'll link down below that extensively covers how to genuinely and fully train foot pronation and dorsiflexion in a really effective way. So I would check that out down below if you feel like that your foot is likely part of the issue, which for many people it is.